you hear the word Metroidvania, what is the first game that comes to mind? Maybe it's the rich and atmospheric world of Hollow Knight, or maybe it's the adaptive roguelike take on the genre Dead Cells, or maybe it's even just the namesake of the genre, Metroid and Castlevania. Now, apart from the amazing music and visuals, what do all of these games have in common? Their formula. Every single one of these is a side-scrolling, exploration-based game where the player acquires new abilities that aid in moving through and discovering more of the map. But there is one thing about this formula in particular that sticks out. Why are Metroidvanias almost always 2D side-scrollers? Over the past few decades, there have been very few attempts to make 3D Metroidvania games, with even fewer of them being successful. Hell, the only really popular attempt at the formula in 3D that I know of is Metroid Prime, and even that series struggles to get new games out. Now, I know what some of you may be thinking. About Souls games. Uh, yes, they do contain some elements of a Metroidvania with a heavy emphasis on exploration, but it's severely lacking in terms of other parts of the formula, such as gaining new abilities that aid in exploration. Instead, they choose to focus more on their RPG elements of leveling up and upgrading your gear. So, while Souls likes and Metroidvanias do share elements, they are mostly separate as genres. But what if I told you that there was a good example of a 3D Metroidvania that was released around the peak of the genre on the PS2? In fact, what if I told you that it was a Castlevania game that took heavily from the game that unofficially started the genre, Symphony of the Night? Well, today, why not take a look into it with me as we talk about Castlevania Curse of Darkness? Now, before we get into the game, I should preface that most of the characters in this game show up in the Castlevania Netflix series. So if you watched that series, some things will be familiar and some will be brand new. So let's just start off with a recap of the exposition. For the most part, it's about the average fare you would expect from a Castlevania game. Dracula was defeated by a Belmont and left a curse on the land that spreads disease and makes people violent and murderous. Now, while this bout of genocidal insanity is overtaking half of Europe, Hector, who is a double forge master, or a vampire sex slave if you watch the Netflix series, abandons Dracula's court to settle down with his fiancée, Rosalie. Now, since happy endings don't start at the beginning of a story, Rosalie gets burned at the stake, partially because of the influence of Dracula's curse, and partially because Hector's former co-worker, Isaac, was moderately miffed that Hector just abandoned Dracula's court. So to get back at Hector, Isaac spreads rumors that Rosalie is a witch, and after she ends up as the next guest of honor at the town barbecue, Isaac leaves a message informing Hector that he caused her death, and if he wants revenge, to come to an undisclosed abandoned castle, which is where the game takes place. Now again, if you watch the Netflix series, you may be wondering, hey, oh, where's Isaac? Who's the redhead twink flirting with the devil? Why is he wearing a gimp suit in the 15th century? I uh, really like, can't answer that last one, but the twink there is Isaac. Yeah, probably the largest difference between this game and the Netflix series is Isaac's character. In the Netflix series, he has complex motivations and is very dynamic across the seasons, while here Isaac's character is mostly just a psycho when he gets you. Now that the exposition's out of the way, let's talk a bit about the actual game. If you've played Symphony of the Night before, like I said in the intro, it's kind of the same, but 3D. There's leveling, different weapon types, a large map with a focus on exploration, and there's even a few of the smaller things like backstepping and summits. And yeah, Symphony of the Night is a good game, so it makes sense that they would follow a formula. But that's not all. There's also a bunch of other systems that build upon the formula really well. Some of them even feels ahead of its time. Crafting, blocking, perfect guards, item stealing, weapon combos, even Pokemon style evolutions for summons. Yeah, your summons can evolve and gain new abilities, strengths, weaknesses. In fact, uh, let's take a bit to talk more about them. So, something that is common across almost all the Metroidvania style Castlevania games is the inclusion of some mechanic that differentiates it from the rest of the games in the series. In Curse of Darkness, that gimmick is Innocent Devils, or Summons, which are tied to a number of progression abilities including Time Stop, Gliding, and Traversing Through Walls. And like I mentioned before, yes, they have Pokemon-style evolutions, but they aren't tied to level like you would expect. Instead, it is tied to Evo Crystals, which drop from enemies when you defeat them with different weapon types. Gather enough of a certain color, and they evolve to a different version with a new stat spread and different abilities to learn. And as you can probably guess from the fact there are different crystal colors, 
there are branching paths in the evolution trees. But how complex can it be? I mean, it's a PS2 Metroidvania, and this is only one battle mechanic out of several, and it's also in 3D, which the Castlevania dev team has barely even worked with, most of the time even failing to work with. Well, there are five different crystal colors, six different double types, and each type has about 10 to 15 different evolutions. And it's not just tacked on evolutions for an illusion of depth either, since they all perform differently in battle based on what evolutions they are. If you go through the game using only one weapon type, and do another playthrough with a different weapon type, you have a high chance of having a completely different set of summons and abilities based on what you use. And this is just the summons. I haven't even talked about the weapon types that are tied to this whole system yet. So if the summons are so varied, then surely the weapons aren't all that different from each other, right? Also incorrect. There are swords, axes, spears, knuckle dusters, and it's not like each weapon has just one attack either. Most weapon types have a unique combo with different finishers you can perform as well. Sure, it's not as complex as something like Devil May Cry, but it still opens up options and makes combat much more entertaining to participate in than just swinging a sword, like in most of the 2D Metroidvanias. On top of this, there are special weapons that are a whole class of their own. Tired of using swords? Just whip out a baseball bat. Or an electric guitar. Want to try using ranged combat? Then you can try using a boomerang or a shuriken. Or hell, even a Molotov cocktail. Feel like these weapon choices are still too normal? Well, I can assure you that there's nothing like breaking into a monster infested castle in the 15th century and tearing through a room of demons using a fucking Gatling gun. Which brings us to the next part of this video, crafting. And here we come to the system used and abused by every modern game released. The only difference being that when this game was released, crafting was pretty much non-existent in games. So if you played this back when it was released, there was a pretty high chance that this was the first time you saw a crafting system in any game. Thankfully, it's also implemented pretty well for the most part. Crafting is done with materials dropped by enemies and are used to either upgrade a weapon to a new version or create an entirely new one. Additionally, drops are fairly common, so when you go through the game, you almost always end up getting regular upgrades to your weapons. The problem is that if you aren't really lucky or you're going for specific weapons with rare materials, suddenly you'll be stuck grinding, which is probably where the game falls flat the most. One of Metroidvanias, at least in my eyes, is exploration, so when you have to stop to grind, it kinda kills the fun. Thankfully, random drops aren't the only way to get materials, as you can also steal them at opportune moments. You hit a perfect guard on an enemy, now you can swipe its tools. A monster misses you with a special move, you can swipe your scales. And if you want the rare strong weapons, bosses can also be stolen from under unique conditions, which encourages you to really explore what a boss can do and how you can exploit it. So apart from the instances where material can only be obtained from drops, the crafting is also pretty well done and feels pretty good, especially considering how it was a pretty new concept at the time. Now that we've gone over everything in the gameplay department, what's the story like? It's pretty good overall, but well, I'd rather not go too into detail as I mainly just wanted to get more eyes on this hidden gem and encourage you all to experience it for yourselves. So instead of just giving you the story, I'll give you a few ways you can experience it on your own. Now there's at least some chance that this game gets released in a collection by Konami at some point down the road, but if you don't feel like waiting, I feel inclined to inform you that there are several good emulators out there for PC and mobile devices, and if you own a copy, you can legally emulate it. If you don't have a legal copy, I would never, in my life, suggest that you break the law to enjoy a game that has not been re-released in over a decade. No, no, no. Please, I insist you buy it from an Amazon scalper charging 2 to 3 times the price it was originally released at. If you don't have the legal means to play it, there's plenty of gameplay videos that you can watch online. In fact, you could also consider checking out my Twitch, where I'll be livestreaming a fresh playthrough of the game on the hardest difficulty. Yes, I will get my shit pushed in by it, so you will get to both enjoy a forgotten classic and laugh at my own masochism. I'll probably even release an edited cut of the playthrough here for your entertainment, so go ahead and subscribe as well if you want to. And now that that's all out of the way, I did want to talk about a few more things with this game. So I wasn't too sure where to put this part in particular, but as uh, screw it. Uh, I did want to mention the extra content that unlocks when you beat the game. So completing a playthrough unlocks two extra game modes, the first of which is Trevor Mode, which involves you going through the game playing as Trevor Belmont. 
guy from Castlevania 3 and one of the cast of the Netflix series. There's not really any story to it, but it's still a cool continuation of the Belmont mode from other Castlevania games. Second is Crazy Mode, which gives all enemies 10 extra levels, and the strong enemies of the game 20 extra levels. I remember trying to play through this game mode when I was like 14 and just getting absolutely demolished by the first enemy. So it's absolutely no joke when it comes to difficulty and it even unlocks a special item if you beat it. Lastly, there's also a boss rush mode. And it's not for the fan of heart either. The last five bosses are their own gauntlet. It was easily the hardest boss rush out of all the Castlevania games that I've played. So why did it fail? Well, fail may be a pretty harsh word, I'd say more along the lines of why wasn't it that successful? It's hard to pin down any one reason because there are quite a few factors, the first of which is that it starts to lose steam in the second half. The last three areas of the game are 90% linear walks to a destination with a couple side areas to explore if your summons have the right abilities, and it really starts to wear by the end of the game. And while that certainly sucks, and it's a point against it, it also doesn't really explain its low success since reviewers wouldn't hit that point before regular review. And most people would have recommended it regardless because the last three areas can be done in about 2-3 to three hours out of this total of 12-16 to 16 hour game. Instead, what I think was the main problem with the game was none other than Devil May Cry 3. But, why would this affect Metroidvania? DMC3 is very clearly a different game from Castlevania in almost every aspect. Except for one, setting. You see, both games look pretty similar in their settings and enemies. Enough so that when DMC1 was released, there were articles talking about how DMC was Capcom's answer to Castlevania. And while in retrospect we can look back and say that's a terrible take, Back in 2005, there were probably a lot of people that thought they looked similar and just went with DMC. What didn't help either is that the only other Castlevania game that was released on the PS2 was a more traditional style Castlevania game with a pretty heavy focus on having a more complex combat system, and even included some pretty detailed combos. And now, I have no hard feelings towards DMC, especially not DMC 3. Its gameplay is the PS2 equivalent of a crackdown game. Believe me, I've gone through all of the games in the series multiple times, excluding two. But still, I wish Curse of Darkness got the love it deserved, because maybe there would be a lot more 3D Metroidvania games today. Hey, I hope you all enjoyed the video. If you did, consider subscribing, or following me on Twitch, or, God forbid, Twitter. Thank you all so much, and I hope to see you all again in another video.